Hello, everybody. Welcome to a workshop special celebrity guest Q&A. Today our, today, our guest is Martha Chavez. Martha Chavez is a Latin Canadian LGBTQ award-winning comedian, actor, activist, and emerging playwright. Martha play, paints hilarious stories drawn from heavily personal experiences like her upbringing in Latin America with her uh, with her unique sense of humor, friendly in your face style and devilish charm. She came to Canada as a refugee, but Martha has established herself as one of the country's most sought after comedians. She's known throughout Canada for, uh, coast to coast for her coast to coast stand up tours uh, and for her tailor made corporate shows. Her many appearances on CBC's Laugh Out Loud, the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival and the Winnipeg Comedy Festival, as well as the debaters, and as a regular cast member of the hit CBC show, Because News. She starred in two national comedy specials, Comics on the CBC and Something About Martha on the Comedy Network. In addition, her one woman show, Staying Alive and In Times of Trouble, were fe was featured on the Solo, Solo uh, Festival and uh, the Aluna Theatre Festival in Toronto. Also, her one-woman show, The Diary of a Young Lesbo, was featured in NYC Solocom. She's done small parts in movies, the most memorable of which was with Denzel Washington and with Chris Rock and Down to Earth, as well as with the Raptor 50 Cent in Get Rich or Die Trying. Martha won the Stand Up Comic of the Year Award in 2018, uh, as the 2018 at the 2018 Canadian Comedy Awards. And her comedy album, Chunky Salsa, was featured among the 11 best comedy albums of 2019 in Intero Bang Magazine. In her own words, she's the most famous LGBTQ Nicaraguan Canadian stand-up com comic in the world. Please welcome to our rectangle today, Martha Chavez. Hello. Hi. I wonder who wrote that bio. Was it me? <laughs> it may have been. Yes. We're, 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 we all think that highly of you, Martha. We're very happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so if you've never been here on one of our workshop Q&As, the way it works is we're all given an opportunity to ask questions. You can ask questions of your own in the, in the comments and we will feature them in the stream. Uh, starting out with me, I wanted to ask the obvious question that everyone wants to know, how has COVID-19 affected your comedy, Martha? Oh, um, well, you know, it's, uh, I think that I have become really accommodating at the beginning, I was reluctant to do shows on, on Zoom because I think uh, stand-up is an interchange, it's a dialogue between you and the audience, but it's war. We have to accommodate to whatever we have. And I think that I have um, a, sorry, acquired a new skill because it is a skill to talk to, to the camera. It's like, uh, you know, like uh, I never thought very highly about YouTube stars, but now I have learned from them. You don't care if nobody laughs, you just say what you have to say. Yeah. Awesome. And, and uh, as writing, I have been writing a lot because I uh, started taking a, a course, a writing course in Spanish in the University of Toronto, a short story. Um, you know, course and, and a lot of homework. And when you write uh, in another language or in another genre, it helps with your own comedy. So it's, it's been bad, but not as bad creatively. Creatively, it has been good. Good to hear. Our next question you. is from Lachlan. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Lachlan from Saskatoon. Uh, hi, Lachlan. Hi. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, my question is kind of a, a bit more vague than I would prefer. Um, I'm familiar with Canadians, comedians that I would describe as successful that have moved to the States and they kind of only do things in the United States. And then people that are uh, successful and working just within Canada. And, and from what I've read about you, you you've sort of are a bit in both. And I, I was just wondering if you could share some insights about getting work in the United States and, and how easy that was or how you went about it? Well, you know what, at the beginning, like in the 2000s, I was obsessed that I wanted to move to Los Angeles, that uh, I had good management in Los Angeles and everything. And, and that, you know, being Latina, I thought, oh, this is just like, I, I'm just gonna come and things are gonna start raining on me, but then, 
So something happened in my personal life. My mom got sick and uh, the money that I had put away for my moving to Los Angeles, definitely I spent on her, which I don't regret whatsoever. Then when I came back, I went to stay with her till she passed, they were brain cancer. So when I came back, I met my wife and I didn't want to go anymore. I didn't want to go. I, I started thinking, why is it that we cannot fight to have our art recognized here? I mean, uh, the, 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 the thing about, oh, I'm going to become famous, that's a crapshoot. Whenever, uh, you, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it doesn't work that way. You have to, to strive to be the best that you can be. And it just didn't happen to me in the United States. I don't, I don't feel like going now, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you can go, I mean, if you have $10,000 to get a, your visa, you can go, but remember, you're not the only one to Los Angeles and to New York, all the comics from, from the United States go there to try their luck. We are not the only ones, you know? Thank you. Yes. Next, we've got a question from Jen Bob. Hey guys, uh, I'm Jen Bob. I'm here in Calgary, Alberta. And I was just wondering how broil season's been treating you. How what? Excuse broil me? Broil season's been treating you. Oh yeah, because winter, winter, broil, winter. I love it. I love it because I mean, the, the, you, you have to go out when, when it's warm, you have to go out. And you, I, I love my bicycle nuts. So I, I have been biking, but as I said, I, I, I did something wrong with my back and then uh, I haven't even been biking that much, but I, I love the, the summertime. Yes, especially during pandemic. Next, we've got a question from Lolly B. So I'm wondering how how long you've been in Canada and how long you've been doing stand up. Well, I've been doing stand up 27 years. It's a it's a it's a life. If it's a life <laughs> life, um, how like when you go to jail, I am a lifer. 27 years, but I didn't come. I didn't start out as a stand-up. I've been here 36 years. Yeah. And I became here when I was 17. Now you can add all of the numbers. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, 27 years, not professional. Because you know how you go, you, you start a little by little. Uh, touring, I have been touring for 20 years. Yeah, and uh, the, the most uh, challenging thing about that is to keep fresh your material and, and to advance i mean to evolve with you to have your act evolve with you excellent thanks next we've got a question from amira hello um hi amira so um like what what's your biggest challenge like being a female in comedy and like how to have you overcome it um, you know what? People have been asking me that a lot because of uh, of the Me Too and all of those things. But I I just didn't know how would I say that not that it didn't happen that we the, that, that we stand up is a male dominated field, but I just didn't notice. You know what I mean? I was I was, uh, I was the remember I have to fight with several things the, the accent. That the that comedy is different in a, in another language, uh, that I wanted to be able to communicate. I was obsessed with other things, and I just uh, I just look like the horses. You know when the horses you cover their eyes like this, and they just they just look at the front. That's all I I did, and uh, and you know like I hold my own. I have held my own through the years. Yeah. Thank you. So that brings me to a question. Comedy is an industry with no HR department. So what can we as comedians do to make uh, comedy a safer place for everyone? Um, well, I would say uh, whenever you see something, say something. 
don't try not to be an asshole yourself you know what i mean because we all we all have to to take part in this to help the other ones to help the the, the most vulnerable ones but comedy has changed a lot huh? for example when i began the the mcs and other colleagues i would kill right in a room and then to extra me they would go marta chavez nobody understood one word she said and that hurt me but uh i just decided to so you know what i mean to like the dogs like i let it sleep i'm not gonna concentrate on that because i i saw that i had just killed but if i had done badly and they would be making fun of the way I talk or the way I look or whatever, that would have been more difficult. I think that you have to grow a very thick skin. I don't mean for um, sexual assault or anything like that, but as per your your uh, your struggle, be, being uh, bigger than some other people's struggle, you just have to, you know, you just have to grow a thicker skin. At least the women of my generation did. Uh, now women are not like that. Like, uh, uh, you know, like you have your the special rooms, you have safe uh, environments, you have uh, a lot of rules. We, like the, the women from my, my generation from that came up in the 2000s, let's say, Deborah Di Giovanni, Heidi Foss, Christine Von Hagen, and all of those, we didn't take shit from people but we didn't have a special treatment we just had to be there with the lions <laughs> and do the best that you could yeah speaking about battling the lions we from here question from amira <laughs> um has anyone stolen any of your jokes and if so what would you do about it have they have, have they stolen um so me i saw the other day a meme that was literally one of my jokes, my oldest jokes. You know what? I always like, even when uh, telephones didn't have uh, cameras, I always take my set. So if I saw anybody using a line of mine, or I, I had proof. You know, like I have tops of VHS, mini VDs, uh, DVDs, and, and all of that. And I always, I'm protective, I'm very protective of my material. But also, I know that I can scream, I can write another joke. I, uh, you know, like, uh, it, it's horrible. It happens. Sometimes it's not even your colleagues who are going to steal your material, but you're going to see the joke in a, in a show, mm -hmm. in an actual show. Somebody that saw you performing. Wasn't it, wasn't it you that cre uh, coined the term Mango Mussolini? Yes. Like everyone, yeah, yeah, that, that was her. And like everyone loved that. And like it got, I, I saw that everywhere, but it was hers. <laughs> yeah, but what, what are you going to do in these times of the, in these days of the internet, when you put something out there, you know that some people are going to run with it. Yeah. So what, what are you going to do? What you have to be, you have to do is to be the most original that you can so people cannot rip you off. And even then, it could happen, you know? But uh, fortunately, it hasn't happened a lot. Yes. That's the thing. We cannot copyright. Right. Yeah. So uh, in lieu of being able to copyright and, you know, branding is, is, means something different and more personal for comedians. So with your very unique identity, how do you, uh, how do you pitch that as an appeal? Because you've, you've managed to land on numerous corporate gigs and you're very good at that what's your what's your pitch and appeal process and how do you use your identity as part of that well you know i i realized at one point that i was uh, that, that the things that i thought that were my hinder my handicap which was my ethnicity and my accent were the things that made me different and in comedy you have to be different who oh, you know what i mean you have to have a hook you have to have a, and also I work clean. So let's say tomorrow they send me to, to work. I'm doing a show for Procter and Gamble in the, uh, a corporate show. And they say squeaky clean. The <laughs> show goes squeaky clean. No controversy and I'm controversial. 
but sometimes you just uh, it's the client who is demanding this. So nothing controversial. You have to imagine whom is your audience. Always, always take uh, the the client is the one that uh, that uh, if you're going to approach this as a business and not as an art, which at my age, darling, I approach it as a business because uh, you have to pay the rent, right? So the the client has a. Uh, has all the rights to ask you what they want. That's why I don't understand why people keep complaining. Oh, that the the the, the cancel culture. Cancel culture has always been there. All the corporates that I have ever done through my life, all of them they say what you can and cannot say. We don't want the F word. We don't want the, any cursing. We don't want you. We want you to keep it uncontroversial. Uh, we want. Uh, we. Uh, I have had a. Uh, instructions we don't want the c word <laughs> <laughs> so you know like uh cons cancel culture has a uh, in an in a broader uh, term has always been there the only thing is with with the other cancel culture that uh, uh right wingers talk about now is that uh, before you or anybody had the had the right to diss me and now i have a mouse you know, I'm going to answer to that. You, why is it only, why is it only you that has the right to come and say some whatever about a person? I can answer. You know what I do when I enter in these uh, fights with people on the internet about uh, freedom of speech? You can say anything. I go. We are on the Facebook. I go into their their personal accounts, and I uh, take a picture of their family, and I say, "This child is ugly." This child has the teeth of an alligator. You will see how fast they begin saying that uh, that uh, you're not you you you're not allowed to say anything that that crosses your your head. <laughs> it's okay, you know, like they are idiots. Like for example, for morons, we should have had instead of Black Lives Matter, we should have had racists are murderers. So it's. <laughs> So, so, so it's more direct, you know. Instead of Antifa, we should have a people that hate Nazis. You know, you know what I mean, because sometimes people don't don't understand the the what is it that we are fighting for or against. You know. Have you noticed a change uh, in the perception of that? culturally and how do you address that change culturally now that uh like uh, that now uh with the with gen z and such with gen, gen z yeah gen i mean millennials and gen z oh, yeah. have like like a, are like have their they have this new like only punching up st style of comedy but we always had that yeah we always are accepting bodville that uh yeah, that uh, yeah. milton bird will say my wife and my mother-in-law and all of those and all of that but that but uh, still you know they were actually talking about certain villains because mother-in-laws are villains <laughs> <laughs> what are the villains of, of the of the time well you know what i never punched down yeah. what I, what i know is that certain things can be constructed as the comedian punching down because maybe they didn't understand the joke i i believe that we are our our worst enemies that the work people, we we sometimes can go overboard with this thing. And in reality, we have, I mean, this is no more horrible than the 1960s. This is not more like, a, like the Procter & Gamble that I was doing the corporate show. People have been mad because they say that they, um, that they are kissing corporate people, kissing us to the gay people with the flag and all of that, and what do you want? That they don't kiss us to us, but punch us? I'd rather, I'd rather have to be of people kissing us to us than punching Don't you think? I think I, I'll take all the pandering I can get. <laughs> yeah, they want to pander, pander. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. it's not ideal, but yeah. it is a lot better than, than before. Uh, there's always, there's definitely always been a rule against punching your audience. <laughs> there has always been a rule against against uh, meanness. I don't, I can't stand meanness. And when it's done, when it's done well, it's hilarious. But yeah. you have to know that the comic is kidding. 
it's a very it's a very thin line of uh, it's like a, like Nick Walenda balancing the the, the thing in, so so he doesn't fall in the Niagara Falls. You know, it's like a, it's a balance act. And, uh, and they, well, what is discouraging is that comedians that I know for a fact that I raise stand misogynists are uh, because I worked with them for 25 years are complaining about that their rights are uh, infringed upon because now they cannot talk about this and not talk about what well, you shouldn't have talked about that to begin <laughs> with even before you know like you are an, an acronism you are not from this century get on with the program before the robots kill us that is my new one, that the robots are going to kill us. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. any any other questions? Yes. Um, so, like, if anyone does, like, a racist joke, um, what do you, do you, like, if you're on a, a show with them the next time, do you make sure you're, like, after them so you can roast them, or do you just kind of ignore them and not, like, you know, sing to their level? A racist jokes against against Latinos. Yeah, you know what? I have I have yet to hear a racist joke like that. Okay. That they like you know they, that they oh this uh, sometimes there's gonna be the old joke <clears throat> that somebody will say like a stereotype. Uh, Latinos are, uh, are are lazy. Latinos hang out in a hammock. You know, it's you know like. A, how would I say? I pick my battles. I'm not going to be fighting with uh, with people unless it's something real, unless it's Trump. Trump saying that Latinos are rapists and that Latinos are, are bad hombres and all of that because it's a figure, it's a power figure that is saying it and his followers can retaliate against Latinos or against Muslims or, or against whoever he was dissing at the time. And uh, a comic, if he, if they know the what they if they know better, they won't be doing that. But uh, I will say it to them. Maybe I will say I have said it. I have, and I have asked not that I don't want to work with certain people. But you know, um, they can say whatever. I can just change the station as long as they that they are not. How would I say? Uh, they are, they are not causing violence against this or that group. No, but, but for example, like uh, comedy has changed entirely because of the internet. You know, because there, there are a lot of these, these uh, people on the internet spreading hate. And then there comes a comic and then they come and see the comic and you have like a choir. But uh, whenever I have, I have worked with... Um, with this, uh, this, uh, this uh, freedom of speech, warriors, they don't do well. No matter what, they don't do well. They don't. They they have not done well. But I mean, uh, look what happened in London. You know. Yeah. So. So once the client has uh, expressed, you know, what what their conditions are, what they want, what they don't want, how do you then assemble? like a set for a specific client and like for example are you going to bring up some soap jokes to Procter and Gamble no no but I, I told them uh, about the, the experience I had with the dentist for example which is a joke that I already had because last year since the dentists were closed here in Toronto I had to have a, a tooth pulled so the joke is uh, that the dentist said oh look at number 26 is a bad bad it's a, it's a bad guy. He was talking about this as if he was talking about prisoners. And he said, we go, we're we going to have to pull it. And I said, well, but doesn't that tooth matter? And then the dentist said, all oh, teeth matter. And I knew at that moment that my dentist was racist. <laughs> so I told him that joke. Like, you can, you know, when, whenever you do a, a, a corporate, you won't write 45 minutes about the event but you at, at least like five minutes you just read about them and you just like uh that i learned on the road though i learned on my years on the road every little town that i went when we didn't have it in the google or anything like that 
I would take it upon myself and look them up and, and have three lines for about them. And then people think the show is about them. They say they, they feel included. You awesome. know? Yes. Uh, Lachlan, did you have a question? Um, I, I do have a quick follow up question from my earlier one. Do you tour in the United States or do you tour ex more exclusively in Canada? Ex more exclusively in Canada. I haven't toured in the United States because you have to apply for a special visa. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, when Trump was in power, I wasn't going to go willy nilly tour mm -hmm. under the table and then they would catch me and he's a Latina and all of that. So, no, I stay in my country, <laughs> in my Canada country. You know what I mean? Yep. No, no need to go there. Although there are comics that, are, that do do a lot touring in the United States and they make a lot of money, like uh, Ron Jossel. Mm. You know Ron Jossel, the Filipino comic? I yeah. I know I've heard him like on Spotify and that, but I, I don't have a picture of him on my mind right now <laughs> to, to, to know much about him off the top of my head. But. Well, Ron does what they call the B rooms, because mm -hmm. in the States it's a lot more... Hierarchical. Mm -hmm. You have uh, A rooms, you have B rooms, you have C. So he does the B rooms and he makes a lot of money. He makes like in the hundred thousands a year. So it's good to tour in the States if you have the stamina. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Do, do you come no. to Saskatchewan very often? I, uh, I come whenever I go out, out west to do tours. I was in Casino Regina in 2017. That was the last time. Oh. That was the last time. I think that it doesn't even exist now, Casino Regina, does it? Um, I don't go to casinos. Uh, I'm sure it still exists. I don't know how much, how many shows they they how how often they have shows. I I tend to. <clears throat> I've I've never been there for a show because it's usually. Uh, um, mm -hmm. bigger people uh, with bigger prices <laughs> and I live in Saskatoon right now so I don't I don't get down for that but ah, okay well we, you start by somewhere yeah. yeah whatever happened to Rima she's oh there she is Amira she's popping in and out. <laughs> <laughs> we've actually oh, got a question from uh, from Twitch here, uh, if you wouldn't mind. It's, uh, hey, Martha, thank you for doing this. What is your writing process like? Do you keep track of random thoughts you have throughout your day, or do you write sets based on, uh, based on, or write specific jokes based on topics you might get for a gala show, for example? <clears throat> well, it, it, it both things, both things. Like if I'm writing for a topic that I get for for Winnipeg, I'm going to write everything. You know, like cliches about this topic. Uh, sayings about this topic, little experience, and I'm going to focus on that. But basically what I do for my writing is I write and I just let myself go. Something is going to come. Something is going to come. And then you trim. Then right. you trim. But I have, I, you, know, you know how I write? I write in my bicycle. Oh. I think I think about something and, and uh, I think the fact that you your your mind is free is uh you you pedal and then you go and then when you come back home you write that's the, that's the way i write but it's everything by association by enlargement mm -hmm. like you already have this joke so you you keep adding little little uh, little blocks and then you have another joke then completely like you can ditch the original joke um and for example uh for the pandemic the pandemic, one of the most challenging things was to go out to exercise and find a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Because all the Timmy's, the, the McDonald's, everything was closed. So, you know, they, so then I wrote a bit about that and they mixed it with a bit that I already had about going to a bathroom in uh, Alberta, in uh, uh, the town by the pipeline. And then I just change a, a few little things and voila, a new joke. Yeah. So. Nice. Uh, We've got a question also from Facebook uh, about, yeah. uh, do you think there is a market in Canada for Spanish speaking shows like the way Tom Segura has been doing it? I imagine. I have done, I have done uh, shows in Spanish here, but I mean, uh, it's been difficult to pack them. But there is, there is a market. 
and it's growing it is growing but but anyway you have to you have to commit you have to commit to produce the show to book the talent uh, to market and to pack the show and i have been busy but that there is a market there is yeah awesome all right we've got a question coming from lolly I was wondering if you have ever had uh, extremely, um, well, a memory of a really bad heckler and, and your response. Yeah, I have, I have had, uh, uh, once I was doing, uh, I, well, okay, when I started doing comedy, I used to, to, to watch Mike Bullard on stage. And Mike Buller was, I don't know if you know of him, but he was like the, the king of the comeback. And uh, and then that, that was like yakex for me. Like in order to learn stand-up comedy, I think you have to watch a show, you have to watch a headliner the whole weekend. No, you don't learn from uh, shows on, on, on uh, YouTube or shows on, on uh, Netflix. You learn from the live experience. And if you are a comic beginning, to watch a headliner work the whole weekend and know when do you st when do you do a pause when do you do a fake uh, unload when do you do and that's amazing like right? because you before you thought it was magic and now you thought oh there is a formula here and I remember that Mike Buller told me whenever somebody heckles you you wait three seconds because if you answer with um, you know like hard hard Hot headed. Mm -hmm. If you answer hot headed, you may not have the better, the best answer. It may not be funny. And then I, I am all nice on the show, and the and then, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> people, people think she was lying to us. Mm -hmm. She was nice, and look at she became such a bitch. So, but I remember, and also I was obsessed about that. And I, of course, I knew that the, the the weakest points. Of, of me, well, my ethnicity, my accent, my weight, my uh, my look. So I had jokes for all of that. So I took it away from them before they mm. did it to me. Sometimes hecklers are not heckling you. The heckling consists in speaking loud at, a, at the show, and then they are stealing the show. People, the other people in the crowd are not paying attention to you. So that happened to me. In a, in a show in which police, police in plain clothes were drinking. Oh, and they, yeah. and they, were, they were with a woman that they call the cop bunnies. The cop bunnies they are called because they hang with cops. They, they, they like to hang with cops. And I tried to, I was hosting and I tried to shut them up and I, the other people in the, in the crowd, I, I tried to put them on my side because I didn't want to give the show to the other comics in such a zoo. So anyway, the, the tall, tall, tall cop stands up and he goes, shut up, you, shut up. You don't even speak this language. Why don't you go back to your country? Hmm. And then that was, that, that was, that was hurtful. But then I, I waited the three, the three seconds and I said, ladies and gentlemen, Toronto's finest. Oh. <laughs> and then I go, I, I got a huge round of applause. Oh, because man. you know we are your roll of blows and then they left. Then I, but I think that was the, the, the most memorable for me. Well like played. a cop. <laughs> like a cop, a plain clothes uh, cop. But if I had like oh you fucking bitch to the cop bunny, I would have lost them. I would have lost the crowd. You always have to keep your crowd to answer to a heckle. Hmm. Yeah. So keep good. the crowd. Yeah. So good. That's great advice. Masterful. Yeah. Toronto's finest. I love that. I was just say, I said, ladies and gentlemen, Toronto's finest. And then the crowd, because remember, the crowd is tense. The crowd is very tense. They don't know, you know, like I'm, I am in there and they are seeing me being circled by sharks. It's, it's like when you, you are a matador and the bull is there. And the bull is about to to gore you, and the crowd is tense. So when I said that, I sh I opened the vault for the crowd to be liberated of this horrendous feeling, and then they clap, and we were all together, and they had to leave. 
the, the, the bar manager came to tell him, you have to leave. These, these things happen mostly in bars, or it used to before the plague, because now I'm sure that there are a lot of, uh, of people doing shows outside that they have had to develop certain skills to deal with all of, all of the, because outside you're in the wilderness. You have to deal with all of this, right? Yeah. What lessons did you uh, take from your stand-up career when you were uh, acting? Because I know you've done a lot of uh, parts, like small parts, but like parts, right? Like that required yeah. weeks on set. How, what did you learn from uh, your experiences in stand-up that taught you uh, about, that informed you about that world? Okay, being present. Being present because there is nothing more present than stand-up comedy. In stand-up comedy, you're present. If you're not present, you don't do well. So when you apply that to acting, because uh, it, it's a total different beast. You know, it's a total, that's why uh, actors cannot be stand-ups. Because you cannot act, mm -hmm. this. It's a, it's a different beast. But um, that's what I learned, to be present in whatever I was gonna deliver. And they will remember uh, little parts. How, how present can the cleaning lady be, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, so that's that's what I learned. Presence is the most important. I think the presence, the conscious that you are there and that this is the still your stage at this moment, these five minutes, these ten minutes, these forty-five minutes, and that is your stage and that you have to give from yourself to the crowd and at the same time take from them, but it's mostly about what you can give yourself. I love this career. You know that before before the plague. I used to say to my wife, you know, I wish that somebody kidnapped me. So I have an excuse that I, and I don't feel like doing stand-up comedy every day. <laughs> and then COVID kidnapped me. But still, <laughs> but still, I believe that we will come back and it's going to be like the roaring 20s for stand-up comedy because people are starved. The crowds are starved. Although I know that we all have to reinvent ourselves. You cannot come back and, and uh, to the stages now and just do material like if this didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't happen to all of us. I mean, you don't have to dwell. If you saw, I don't know if you did. You see, uh, did you see um, my favorite comic, Brian Reagan? Mm -hmm. His comeback tape. He just like he came back with a uh, white hair, and he said, "I came mm -hmm. back from the." I came back from the pandemic a senior citizen. That was it. <laughs> that he didn't, we, you can't go because also people don't want to be hearing this uh, about this all the time. But uh, undoubtedly, this changed us. This completely changed us. I mean, uh, we were locked up <laughs> for a year and a half. Yeah, the other day I went to I went to the the corridor at home and I wasn't wearing my mask and I came back, you know, like. Like a dog that, that 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 realized I was being a bad dog. Give me my mask. It's uh, it's, uh, it means something, you know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Any other questions from the panel here, Amira? Yes. Um, so if you're like um, like sometimes I bomb, and I don't know if it's uh, like more professional to acknowledge it and and kind of like work with the crowd, like be like, oh, well, my mom likes that joke or something like that. Um, or like that's the reaction I'm expecting, or just kind of go on to the next joke, which one is better. I never bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, it, no but, it, but there is one point, I mean, it's not that I never bomb, but there is one point that nobody's immune to not bombing. You know, like we all bomb in the most important show of your life, in the most, but it, but, some, but it is very uh, sophomore, sophomoric to say, oh, my mom liked that joke. On the other hand, you have to know how to change gears. And you, and, uh, and you, and you how, how long have you been doing comedy? Like a year. Like a year, well, you, you are just learning how to change gears. So if, if a joke doesn't work, I am listening to them what they like and then what they don't, and then I change gear. It's like, uh, like when you're in your bicycle 
on your car, you just, it's not that you will compromise your integrity, but you're just like, oh, they don't like the material about, about my cat. I have to talk about something else and then you move on. But this you learn, that's the, that's the thing that you only learn this by doing it. You know, that you only learn it by doing it. It is always better to, to as I said, watch the others. Where do you live at? Where Boston. do you live? Um, Boston, Massachusetts. In Boston, Boston. Do, you, do, you go, do you go to watch comedy a lot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, you have to watch a lot of comedy and learn from them. Now, the, I, I have noticed also, and this is going to sound catty, <laughs> but... Uh, but it's not. I have noticed also that the new generations don't give a flying fuck if they bomb. You know what I mean? They continue. They continue. They continue with this. Uh, with this thing. The, the, what I have had uh, in, through my whole career is that I'm very, very hard on myself, and uh, and, and that has been a blessing, but it, it also has been a curse. But like for example, I, I would never blame an audience for not responding. I always think that it was me. And, and so that, and that's why I tape myself too. I tape my, my, every show ever since when I started with my big camera, with my little camera, because sometimes you believe that you said something in a way and you said something that had nothing to do with what you thought you said. And, uh, and that's why it didn't work. It wasn't personal. It wasn't uh, your material, but they just didn't get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I ask a question? So, like, so you said don't blame the audience, but can you say, like, okay, well, that didn't work, but like, kind of make a mental note, like, in front of the audience, or, like, or like um, something like that, but funny, kind of just more like a note to cut the tension? I don't know. I, I never did that because I, it made me feel uncomfortable. Okay. But, but, it, but it's a, it I mean, when I have seen other people do it, it makes me feel uncomfortable. But if you do, if you say it once during the set, oh, well, that was just for me. Yeah. But if, if you keep saying it during your set, you can see the people looking at each other and, ah, no, you have, you have to learn how to, it's better you have another ammunition there. You know, and also listen, 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 listen to the tape. Why is it that a particular, if a particular joke doesn't work for three times, that you say it, you are, even if you love it, it can be a diamond of a, in your head, even if you love it. If for three times it didn't, it didn't work, you have to go back to the drawing board and find out why it didn't work. And then the next time you deliver it in another cadence, or you deliver and you say the punchline that you were saying somewhere else, you find another punchline, or you ditch it all together. That, that's, a, that's, that's how, uh, you know. There are jokes that I, I said 20 years ago that uh, they didn't work. And now with more maturity uh, in my delivery and in everything, now I can make them work. Don't. Don't get rid of any material. You always keep everything you have. Because eventually you you may whatever you thought that it didn't work, it will work. Thank you. Excellent. You're when do you abandon your baby? Like you've got a you've got a, a bit that you love and you really <laughs> believe in it but it, it, it's running against audiences like what how long when do you when do you decide to, to drop it if you're if you are if you are te like testing something like do you why do you test a well did you mean uh, something that hasn't worked or something that has worked um sometimes <laughs> i i see some comedians uh who will uh they'll have one joke the joke that is just for them and they'll they'll try they'll try every variation on the theme they'll just go they'll 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 make the they they will implement a joke in their set that's just for them and they'll just try stuff do you do any of that where you uh when you're workshopping do you just leave stuff to try um, no I, I don't know i i uh i don't know i think i work i work different that way okay. um if some if something doesn't work even though i thought that it was the most clever thing that i have said ever 
I did it and I put it for maybe later it's going to work. Okay, let me think about a joke that I uh, that I may have uh, that I have may say that I love that. I don't remember. I, I forgot my act during the pandemic. It's uh, now I'm doing a lot of new stuff about the pandemic, but uh, but uh, about no, it was it wasn't about the pandemic, but about uh, making homemade masks, masks, and all of those things. But um, what, but there I and also with the times, a joke that I said ten years ago, even if that joke killed, and it's tested against time. And uh, because I said so many, so so often and everything, uh, you all grow them. But uh, there are some jokes, like my jokes about about my accent and taking elocution lessons and all of that. That when I bring them back, they kill, as if they they were they, they, they had said it for the first time. And also remember, audiences change. Audiences change. They they are they are the people that haven't heard that joke. But uh, but I think that you have to keep fresh. You have to to keep relevant with what you say. The problem that I have seen with older comics, because as older comic, we don't have to be put to pasture. If uh, if you keep with the times, if you saw John Rivers and uh, Phyllis Diller, they kept they stay on stage until they were ready to die. I think because comedy, you can do it old, you can do it young. But you have to evolve. Your material has to evolve with the times. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. All right. Any other questions from the panel before we move on to the workshop segment? Uh, Jen, did I see your hand? It's hard to tell behind that stupid duck. I'll be honest. Uh, <laughs> did you have a question, Jen? Um, no, I didn't actually. Okay. <laughs> I just down. And then I had All right. I'm like, <laughs> no worries. All right. So we're going to go uh, move on to the workshop now. We're going to do an accelerated workshop uh, with everyone just doing about, you know, about three minutes. I didn't material. do my whole, I didn't do the homework. <laughs> I didn't no do worries. It. It happens. So I'll I'll start us out. I'll, uh, we've got. I'm glad we've already got a, a contemplative crowd here. I'll warm us up. So uh, I uh, I got my topic here is secrets, and then I'm gonna. Uh, so I think I figured out what the secret ingredient in KFC's uh, fried chicken is. It's chicken that's cheap enough to sell for two dollars on Tuesday. I think that's the secret. Uh, I've heard a lot about uh, beauty products that are uh, saying that they're made with a half a cup of serum. Well, that's that's a great selling feature, but I'm really looking for a half a cup of something else. Liquid, maybe? I don't know. I don't know what serum is, but apparently it's a selling feature. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's illegal to disclose, disclose what it actually is. Ever go up to buy a product and the marketing on the box leaves you with more questions than answers? Like there's a brand of crackers that I've been buying for years and suddenly it has a sticker on the box that says now made with real cheese. And I have all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, also, not all recipes need to be keep, kept secret unless it's mm -hmm. for garlic toast because the secret to good garlic toast is murder. Mm -hmm. Also, I was only asking about your recipe to be polite, Susan. I'm not going to destroy your family's legacy if I also make my potato salad with turmeric. Uh, you know what? There's a lot of secret ingredients in, uh, apparently, in the uh, Pfizer vaccine. I'm glad I got it, though. Uh, even, uh, even though it was... Well, you see, now I've heard it can change your DNA, and I'm now with my hair growing in at, during COVID. I'm worried that if I if I even I don't even worry to what my DNA even is to begin with. I'm worried my test will come back three quarters Irish, one quarter Irish setter. Honestly, as soon as I get my second vaccine, first place I go, barber shop. This I, this this shit is getting out of control. But you know, I got my first shot. Uh, it was easy, even easier to get my first shot than it was to learn how to spell Pfizer. 
you know, it was real quick, in and out. Uh, but you, you know how a needle works. Uh, it was just a quick jab. And I apologized to the nurse for punching her. But to be fair, that is my reaction when I get stabbed. Uh, <sighs> yesterday, I, uh, well, not yesterday, the day after I got my shot, I was a little achy. And the only new symptom is and that's new. And I like that, you know, but I am feeling great now. I'm super glad I got my vaccine. And not just because I'm no longer completely crippled by fear, but also my 5G connection is working great. Uh, I got the Pfizer. Uh, I know that there's also the Oxford vaccine, which starts working to its full effect in seven to 10 days. That there's also the Moderna vaccine. That's the one Dolly Parton funded. It starts working in nine to five. Uh, yeah. Anyways, that's uh that's my three minutes. Thank you. Right. Any notes? KFC chicken isn't two dollars anymore. Oh, is it not? I no, just stopped buying. Just thinking about this the other day. <laughs> that's worth noting. Sorry. No, thank you. No, that's very, very helpful. <laughs> I, 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 I would have found that out when restaurants open sooner or later, I'm sure. Uh, but I appreciate the, the knowledge as soon as possible. Also, uh, if I can say something, it is very 80-ish kind of material, you know, like I was the deal with the uh, with, uh, fried chicken, you know what I mean? <laughs> Is uh, uh, I like more when it's more personal. When it was more personal, the job and everything. But the fried chicken, um, I would not do it. I'll cut that one. <laughs> it's probably better for my health if I cut the fried chicken. The fried chicken, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, next up, please. Oh, Amira, Amira, you had a note or? Um, I was. I was just gonna say, like, um, maybe like making a joke about like, um, like you were sick afterwards after the shot or something, and then maybe, maybe combining that with the Maybelline. I don't know, like, I don't know, maybe if it's like it made it made you prettier or something. <laughs> I don't know. Cool. Oh, All right. I, oh, sorry, Lolly. Sorry, I don't like to diss you because I think you're pretty funny, but the a lot of the like the post COVID is all stuff that I've seen continuously on you know, like Facebook feeds or whatever, little memes. So it's mm -hmm. kind of fair enough. Um kind a little of, tired. Oh yeah, heard that before, you know. So anyway. Okay dope. Sorry. No worries, no, I get it. I didn't have a chance to write too much new material for you. Yeah, I know that feeling. Next up, please welcome to the big rectangle, Lachlan. Oh, hello. Is there any chance someone else to go uh, right now instead of me? Uh, Jen, Bob, how you feeling? Anyway, I can go. Okay. I was just interrupted by um, by my mm -hmm. one of my children. Um, so I won't tell you my topic. It will become apparent uh, as I go along. Uh, so here it goes. Um, my brother-in-law sells designs and sells banners. That's his life's work. He doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have kids. He doesn't have a dog. He's not the cool uncle. He has banners. I've always wanted to ask him how he got into the banner business. But I know I can't ask that without sounding like, why in the world do you care so much about banners? I can't not be judgmental. If he told me he was moving to Switzerland to study playing those really big horns that they play on mountains, I'd say, <laughs> now you're making sense. <laughs> That's way better than banners. Banners are basically just lame kites. They have all the fabric and wind-catching properties of a kite, but they don't want to fly. They would rather stay attached to a pole and share information no one wants. Banners are like 95% celebration and 5% 5, 5 message. The messages are just logos, slogans, and empty boasts. Our team is the best. Why? Because we put it on a colorful banner, and this issue is not something you're going to think deeply about. Banners don't change people's minds. I don't know how you get rid of homophobia, but I know you don't do it with a banner. 
Maybe I'm being kind of harsh about banners. Uh, maybe more details on a banner would work. I would love to see someone end a relationship via banner. It could be a whole series of banners on Main Street. Carla, we're through. It's John. I'm breaking up with you. We're in different places emotionally. You want me, but I don't want you. You're attractive. The sex is good, but the bottom line is I don't really respect you. And research says that's important. So let's end this now. I would, I would go down to Main Street just to see a banner like that. It's a banner I could get excited about. It's gossip on a flag. Okay, I'm done. What's the font size on that banner? Yeah. <laughs> or the length. I love. I thought about mentioning font. Was was the word banners? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's not a topic I feel passionate about, but I did pay attention to banners for the last few days. I think it was good. It was uh, you were lucky to have a uh, additional your uh, personal connection. Hey, we gotta we gotta say goodbye to Martha now, you guys. Unfortunately. Bye, bye. bye guys. Bye, guys. I have to go. Bye. Uh, keep in touch. Keep in touch. Look me. Uh, look, look me on the Facebook, and we become friends, and I can answer whatever question you have. Thank you for having me. But look, you know what? I have an excruciating pain, and I wanna go pull my my legs up. Feel better. Oh, my lower back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming, and we uh, value all of the answers you've given us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. I did not mean to dip out Lachlan. I'm so sorry. Oh, I didn't notice. I was too absorbed in what I was doing. <laughs> well, I was going to jump in to go ahead of you, but then my connection dropped. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I had some connection dropping problems this round too. <laughs> I really liked that lock one. I thought that was really funny. There is a Canadian comedian named Kevin Banner. Oh yeah, I, I've I've thought of uh, people with that last name actually, but I didn't. Yeah, he. I actually met him at the very first amateur like or pro am night that I went to in Victoria. He's. I think he's back living in vancouver again i think anyways he moves back and forth mm -hmm. it i think it would be really funny to tag him in that joke somehow yeah, yeah perhaps i Just, don't know if i'll do the joke again <laughs> i said i thought i will do but i have to say i thought it was pretty good i think that has legs i enjoyed oh, it thanks. also too because so many cities have banners that they put up every summer yes so that could, yeah, I could see that having legs, that joke. All right, thank you. It was a good treatment of the concept. Like, you could take that concept without, like, the weight of having to write to the word banner. And that's an interesting premise to, like, have someone airing out their dirty laundry publicly like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to do, do a bit better job with the actually communicating via banners, but... Uh... On short notice, I thought of breaking up via banner. People who make banners have the same problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Lolly, uh, we're gonna we're gonna set you up next, and uh, you and Jen Bob's uh, competing bad connections are gonna are gonna fight, and yeah. uh, we're gonna <laughs> you guys are, the, are up next, uh, both of you, and uh, we will keep popping you back in. <laughs> okay. So uh, I realized that we all ignored your uh, instruction, Jester, to open our question with a brief um, bio about ourselves. <laughs> I don't think anyone did that. So I'll just let you know that I'm coming to you from the armpit of Vancouver Island for Alberni. <laughs> it's part of my long-term goal to not live here anymore. Um, my theme was theme parks. And uh, one of the first things that I thought of when I was given the assignment of theme parks was the first time that I went to Disney. And I was like, oh my God, this is a plastic facsimile of Europe. This is like the cobbled fairy tale uh, facades that we see in villages all across Europe. That's what they've done in Disney. I was like, oh my God, this is, yeah. 
So when I heard about Euro Disney opening, I was like, why would they put a plastic fairy tale facade in Disney in Europe? Because that is exactly what the rest of Europe looks like, minus the roller coasters. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe in Euro Disney, they make it look like America. And, uh, you know, like the, the Rust Belt or the Dust Bowl or Compton, maybe just like New York in the 70s and people come out and mug you. Uh, I, it's possible. It's possible. Um, but I think we need to expand our ideas of what a theme park could be because, you know, they don't have to just have rides and be for kids. We could have like road raid theme parks for people that don't want to follow rules. We could have theme parks for your pets. How about theme parks for smokers? They'd appreciate that. I think also too, we could do like an emotionally themed theme park. Joy, grief, and then we keep the roller coaster there for, you know, the emotional roller coaster for that theme park. And um, that's about all I have written. That's a fun topic. <laughs> I've heard uh, I've heard that a lot of theme parks are dangerous, but ABC News assures me that Disneyland is just super safe right now, you guys. Okay. I'm excited to go to theme parks again. I've uh, I've heard they're uh, going to be like running all of the rides. They're gonna like not have. They're gonna give you everyone like their own car in roller coasters, which sounds kind of cool, but also like, oh man, like I already don't like the line to go to the grocery store. You don't. I don't need more reasons to have a longer line at a theme park. But. I oh, I do want to go to a ghost town theme park. That does sound like a fun idea. Maybe a COVID themed theme park. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They uh, there's extra there's extra spray on the log flume in the COVID theme park. In a COVID theme park, it could just be people constantly talking about COVID and asking like, oh, like what have you been up to? Like there's like a certain painful conversations that happen over and over again uh, because of COVID-19 that could be part of a of a very boring <laughs> COVID-related ride. Unless they're planning that grief-themed uh, park that we were talking about, and then COVID-19 is a perfect uh, mascot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this little COVID guy. Yeah, just bouncing around. Their water uh, like you get cotton candy. Each coat. one of those little crowns could be like made out of cotton candy, and you can just nom, 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 grab one. I like the idea of a, of the the ride that or that was. I think he might have said New York in the nineteen seventies or something. Oh, like that was still good. Yeah. Like a or even like this is like an American. Like it's an like I'm thinking if it's a small world, but like some American twist. Like it's a very unjust world or. Um, uh, I I don't know, but I, I I an image popped to mind to me of, of, okay. of being in Times Square in the old days and and uh, all the characters down there terrorizing people. I kept waiting for you to tell me which mascot was mugging you. I wanted to I wanted yeah. to know. <laughs> I think I, I think I think I think New York in the seventies would be awesome for Halloween weekends. It could really really make it scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, had, I had a lot more notes, a bit scattered, and it, like where I live is actually a lot like a theme park. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kind of like a trailer park theme park. But I just, I'm kind of, it's like 33 degrees in here, and I'm just kind of run out of steam. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh. so. Or they could have like water rides where you walk through a crowd of people sneezing. <laughs> it's also a fear factor ride too. Danger, yeah, danger theme. The COVID theme park, instead of a merry-go-round, they have a virus-go-round. 
just getting jabbed with a needle every time you go around. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the bathroom, so they have signs up saying this bathroom has hasn't been cleaned since. <sighs> like, uh, new haunted house ideas. Yeah. Oh yeah. I know when I first, uh, yeah, I'm just not at my at my best, but I know when I first thought of it, I was like, oh, we need like to expand on, remember how uh, those escape rooms became really popular? Like what, mm. what triggered the escape invention of the escape room and suddenly every city has escape rooms. And then I was like, oh, if it's an escape theme park, it's like a, an episode of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> My life tech. has yeah. become an escape room, and I am losing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Losing. I'm losing. Hmm. Next up. Thank Is you. that any Everyone? Uh, I still got to go. Jen Bob. Hmm. So, my topic is memories. And to be honest, I don't have a good memory, hence why I have a book of notes. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, it's more like a goldfish cracker memory because goldfish have three second memory and I have none. Um, people say my memory isn't the best because I smoke pot, but I'm pretty sure I wasn't smoking pot back in grade school. Fairly certain cranking my head off a car from years back didn't help the situation at all. But uh, now I'm getting to the age where I should be worried about losing my memory. Instead, since I don't have kids, I'm more concerned about losing my video game memory instead of forgetting my kid in a hot car. <laughs> I got a chuckle, I'll take it. Um, that, that's all I got. <laughs> I had good jokes and I couldn't remember them before I wrote them down. <laughs> that's I something I suffer from, Jen. Yes. I can't count the number of times I thought, oh, that joke's so funny, I'll never forget it. Yeah. Two yeah. seconds later. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Memory. At least you've got that notebook to help you recall the sequence of events. It all, uh, sequence of events. It also helps that I can drop uh -huh. on it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's, oh, actually that's like a fidget book. I love I that. Draw people. I tell them I'm doing a, uh, a caricature of them, and then I just draw a big black dick. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my personal favorites we're talking about like doing developing a favorite joke i'm like oh no i did that one all just for me <laughs> kid in a hot car was a fun twist <laughs> yeah i guess it's like oh, what else do i have to forget uh to go to the weed store gotta remember that Go to work. Not forget invisible children. Okay. I'm sorry I don't have any feedback. Um, yes. I did like I the... can't remember what else you said. <laughs> there wasn't much. Oh, is, it, is it my turn to remember what you said? Goldfish. Oh, yeah. Okay. Goldfish cracker memory. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love a good pun. I guess you could expand on that. The length of memory is of other kinds of fish. Yeah. <laughs> I have a joke about memory uh, that I use in one in my sets, and it says, uh, "I like the smell of uh, gasoline because it remembers reminds me of fond memories as a child, like going boating." And fond memories as an adult, like burning the evidence. <laughs> Does it work well? Pretty well. It's pretty good. It's 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 good uh, when I need uh, a drawback note when like uh, people's attention have split and I need to like say something that makes them hold on to the next sentence. Right. It it's it seems I, I was I, I thought it could work but I wasn't like a hundred percent oh that would work for sure like it, <laughs> but uh, um glad it, glad it does work 
All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Now we've come to the end of the show and we've all got an opportunity to plug whatever we'd like to plug. So starting in the top left corner with Jen Bob. Okay. <laughs> I had to think of which one was right or left. Uh, I've got the little tag thing right about, uh, I don't know where to point. It's at the bottom anyways. Now uh, at Jen Bob X on Twitter, Instagram, and I think Facebook. The first two definitely. Molly? I still got nothing. <laughs> I mean, you can find me on Facebook. But there we go. Yeah, I have almost nothing. I um, if, if anyone wants to follow me on Instagram, I'm Lachlan McWilliams007. I have um, uh, 42, 52 followers. Uh, that's about one quarter of the followers my dog has. And um, <laughs> so I'm trying to catch up to him. And, uh, and I probably won't be posting anything uh, because I'm having no surgery tomorrow and I'm probably not allowed to smile, laugh, or show emotion for two weeks. So. Oh, yikes. Oh. Ah. Good luck with your surgery. I hope it goes oh, well. Oh, thank you. It's fairly minor, but apparently I'll be uncomfortable for a week or so. So. Ouch. That stinks. Yes. But how would you know? Your nose will be all bandaged up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and dripping with blood. Oh. I man. guess this is when you become a mouth breather, Lachlan. <laughs> no, it's supposed to cure me. But while well, you're healing, yeah. wow. you're bandaged. Well, if you follow my Instagram at Jester Lind, uh, I exclusively post pictures of uh, Etch-a-Sketch drawings oh, <laughs> on my Instagram that I've done. Uh, but on other things, I'm more of a normal human person. <laughs> That's a, a commitment. I, you can always, yeah, it's fine. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you thank for you. hosting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.